Good morning, everyone. I'm Justin Overgreder, policy officer at the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung's Competence Center on the future of work. Yes, that's a mouthful. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to this event on participatory design and worker rights in the age of standardized software. Now, there's a lot to unpack in that title, but it all boils down to democracy. I believe in democracy. And for me, that doesn't mean voting once every four years, but it means that people should be able to shape the basic social circumstances in which they live. And this increasingly means influencing and shaping technology. Uh, we live in a technological society. However, for all the talk about democracy, as the, um, all the, the value we give uh, to democracy, I think that we are very far from reaching this ideal of you know, influencing the te technology that shapes our lives. And I think this is increasingly so. And one area where this is really manifest, where this is really obvious for me, is the workplace. I guess we all have examples of um, the digitalization of our own work. And indeed, this is continuing at a rapid, rapid pace, especially since uh, COVID. And there's, for instance, uh, systems that rate and score us, that monitor us, and that manage us, uh, what we know as algorithmic management systems. And these software packages that hit the workplace are often developed by a few multinationals. And oftentimes they're not tailored to the specific needs of workers at particular workplaces. And in that sense, I would say they're standardized, or perhaps a better word is off the shelf. Now, why is that a problem, you may ask? And to me, the answer is pretty clear. It's that workers then find it very difficult to influence these systems. And right now, and perhaps that's different for you, but you're not the relevant, you're not, um, let's say, a representative audience. But for many workers, it's very difficult to, to have a role in designing software systems or to have a choice in whether certain systems get adopted in the workplace or not, or how those systems are deployed and used. And then, of course, there's the more basic question of if workers actually understand the systems that they are supposed to operate. And I think in many cases, the answer is clear, is that they don't. And you only have to look at the latest examples, um, for instance, the opaque and centralized language learning models like GPT-4, know that this trend is continuing. Now, as a result of this lack of worker participation, um, these standard software packages routinely infringe and undermine workers' rights and interests. I mean, this is obvious when we look at data protection, right? In Europe, we have the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, and every time there's a big investigation, it highlights massive rule breaking. But it also holds for other rights. For instance, workers' rights around the core determination of workplace tech. And of course, technology at work also has a huge implications for the quality of work and how that's being done. So then the question for me then becomes, how can workers have a bigger say in the design and deployment of technology? Now, as it happens, there's a rich tradition called participatory design that focuses exactly on this question. How can the users of technology help shape it? The participatory design tradition came to fruition in the Nordics in a time where unions were strong. I mean, in, in the Nordics, they are still strong, obviously, although also they're under pressure. It was also a time where technology firms were less concentrated and less powerful. And I think most importantly, it was a time where our social imagination was not that constrained. Like it was not unimaginable that workers engineers, academics, firms would sit together to design and test hard and software. Now, of course, that's not the world we live in today. Today, the software market is global. Tech firms are very powerful and unions are fighting a rearguard battle in ensuring that the technology that's being deployed is not doing outright illegal things. And I think and again, not to shell you audience short, but I think that there's very few people right now that actually think about um, how to design technology in a way that actually makes workers flourish and that in, in improves the quality of work. So the question then really becomes, how can participatory design be of relevance in this context? Now I come from government, so I don't have a lot of experience with the latest digital technology, uh, nor with democracy at work, to be frank. 
And therefore, you're lucky that you don't have to listen to me to sketch the path forward. In fact, for that, we have the pleasure to listen to Professor Suzanne Bolke, a computer scientist from Aarhus University in Denmark. She has worked in the field of participatory design for decades. And if there's anyone who can sketch and trace the development of participatory design till now, uh, the challenges that it faces, and also to kind of explore the potential of participatory de design for uh, the, democratic, the democratic development of technology at work, then it is her. Now, before uh, we pass the floor to Suzanne, I would like to make a few short statements. First, I would like to thank Joanna Bonovica, Christina Kolkloff, and Michael Six for co-organizing this event. And of course, I would like to thank Suzanne for joining us and sharing her insights. Finally, I would like to say to the audience that um, yeah, given that we talk about participatory design, we also want your active participation. So in the second half of the event, there's also room for your questions and hopefully some answers. For that, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom. You find it at the bottom of your screen. Now, with that said, um, I really would like to pass the floor to Suzanne for her keynote remarks. Suzanne, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just share my slides. So just a second. Yes, so I was asked to give this talk. And to be honest with you, I was thinking, what do I really know about participatory design and workers' rights in the age of standardized software? So it has actually required a bit of scrutiny for me personally, but so, so I, I started by thinking about what's happening in my own workplace in, in all of us university, how are we today making sure that the users have an influence on technology? And I think in a way you can say we don't, if we talk about all of university, we do have uh, a legislation that that talks about how major changes of the means of production should be discussed in the in the local uh, and centralized collaboration committees. Um, it's mainly done, I think, as information. We do have these uh, cooperation committees at several levels. Um, I would actually say it's it's also it's. So one thing that is that it doesn't, I would also say that it's kind of interesting that when you talk about users in a place I like Aarhus University, it's my own experience that for most of these systems, if people are involved somehow, it's normally only the administration. So the scientific staff who are also eventually becoming users of anything from how to settle your travel accounts to your, the teaching systems are actually not uh, considered users that are worth involving in any of this. But I know that that uh, Ola Badelson, who is also himself worked with participatory design, who is a union representative, has tried to discuss this also with management. And I think that that often the the excuse for not involving users at at any level basically more is uh, the whole situation of of tender that 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 uh, there's all the technologies are offered for procurement and tender. So this is of course part of the EU regulation. But 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 I take Ola on the word when he says that that is probably often mainly a time challenge. So so the users we people could have been involved in these processes if it had been done earlier. Now let's look a little bit about what participatory design is. I, I want to say that last year, well the year before, I published a sort of small book for teaching um, with Uli Iversen, Christian Dindler and Rachel Smith where we talked about uh, how we see participatory design today and it's used for teaching in universities and similar places in case you're interested in those sorts of things. But I think participatory design in a way is more than the processes where users, designers and researchers collaborate towards something shared. It's actually a focus on the future. How, 
how can we use the resources, the skills we have today to also to work towards future practices? How do we work with joint reflection and action? How do we do it in, in critical? How are we being critical towards what is happening? And how are we being inclusive in that context? Um, I think it's also important to say that the participatory design is not uh, about involving kind of you and me and the 10 people down the hall. It's actually mutual learning that, that happens between groups, between organization, with organization units, uh, also with, with maybe with union representatives, more, more than it's a simple relationship between individuals. Um, so again, we talk about empowerment of people as individuals, but surely also as part of their of groups and communities that are somehow involved with the technology use and with with a focus on now, but more more actually with a focus on the future. So, and this project design recognizes that that power is not equally balanced in organizations, and I, it takes, I would say its understanding of emancipatory practices from that. And I think in a way you can say that that's actually also what it, what, what it means when we say that participatory design is, is committed to democracy. Uh, I, I thought I would look back and think about where participatory design started. And uh, it actually didn't start so much with how can we work together users and designers as it did with thinking about what the structures be in 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 organizations where you would have management on the one side and and unions and other uh, types of interests on the other side and we the a lot of the work that was done in the early years of participatory design which means back in the 70s was on models for negotiating uh, technology and organizational changes in, in the workplace. Labor unions were, at that point, of course, important partners in this, and, and there was a, a lot of education happening in, for instance, in Denmark, we educated hundreds and hundreds of uh, union representatives to take part in, in, in decisions about technology in the workplace. Um, we have sort of reminiscence of those things in, in the, in the general labor union agreements when they say that, you know, uh, management should, should let, uh, the unions and other representatives know about major changes in the production system, in the production technology. I would say a lot of uh, the details such as what was called technology agreements have largely disappeared along the way. But I think there may be, maybe both the idea of, of educating people to, uh, not as part of management, but as an alternative is a thing that we should reconsider today. But surely also that we may need to reconsider the models that are used for, for, for negotiating technologies in, in the workplace, be they big or small. Oops, one more picture. So I was involved with the Utopia project, which was in a sense, the next generation project of participatory design. And, uh, in the Utopia project, the researchers designed it that they would be interested in actually working with alternatives. And since they all came out of, uh, they weren't engineers, they were software designers and, and researchers in computer science, they turned to a type of work that, that where, where they could do something through software, they ended up being, uh, typographical or graphical production. But actually what is more interesting perhaps is that, uh, one of the things that, that had been sort of learned from the first generation of, of uh, 
projects was that, well, you know, you can have as much influence as you like if there's no, if there are no alternatives to offer, then you you may still have a problem. So the Utopia project and other similar projects focused on alternatives that would somehow support the the workers, the users' skills. There was an explicit focus, and it goes in the name of Utopia. I won't spell out the detail on the quality of the design process, but also of the product that came out. I think Utopia today is often known because we did a lot of work that led to a better understanding of the role of prototypes and prototyping. So the idea that that people need hands-on experience to really experience the future technologies, I would say, is something that came out of the Utopia project. So from this generation, I think it's worthwhile taking both this interest in, in quality and not in automation, but also in, in technical alternatives, in trying to understand that, that just because whatever Microsoft has shaped their technologies in a particular way, it doesn't mean that it has to be that way, that technologies can be offered and it can be worthwhile to, to, to work on and explore different types of, of technical alternatives. Now, of course, both uh, Utopia and the previous projects are very far away. I think there are some interim experiences that we could also activate here. And I think, first of all, it's, it's important to say that doing participatory design does not mean that each and every activity that's happening uh, is involving users. So it's important to understand that there's also kind of a behind the scene thing where where designers are working and, and planning the user involvement. So again, participatory design for me is not a small group of users and designers that sit down and do everything together. I think there are a couple of interesting papers from the late 2000s that, that um, are really uh, relevant here. And coincidentally, they're both about German cases. So one is that uh, Kai Couch, who is now in, in Australia, studied a, um, a case of uh, people. It was a wastewater or water, water supply system where they where they worked on with agile development methods, but where the, the participatory design, the user involvement was really strong. So, so users were placed in central roles in these agile uh, processes, and he, he's written about that in several papers. The other is a paper by Hartmut Obendorf and, and, and more that, that talks about models for how you can organize uh, in open software, how you can organize processes in a way, both across projects and cases where you where you work with user representatives also in what they call communities of interest. So that across cases you can you can have work groups where where users work together with representatives of the designers, but that's a different thing than what you do when you actually work on developing, say, a particular function, a particular task in in one of the cases. So, so I think there is actually work out there that is pointing towards various ways in which um, participatory design can, can happen and at different levels. So I think where we are today is that, the, of course, one of the, the big challenges we have is that uh, very little development today is happening um, as a sort in a standard standalone fashion. So uh, we we are all the time surrounded by multiplicities of platforms of artifacts. Right? With that, with that, I actually mean that that most things need to run both on, say, a phone, a, a, a laptop, and something third. But also we. We have multiplicities, I would say, of, of cultures and work cultures that, uh, but also 
but also of cultures from outside of work that comes into the picture when we're trying to understand what is going on and how new technologies can be introduced. So we have issues, I would say, of both control and compatibility and probably a lot more. I think it's interesting that, that we have uh, a lot of research that's focusing on uh, the differences between what Capsimini and Bannon, Bannon calls intrinsics and, and extrinsic development or practice transformation. Of, and of course, you can say, so some technologies just get come from the outside and in, but there's also a lot of appropriation of tailoring happening in, in the workplaces. So I think it's fair to see what's happening as this kind of movement back and forth between the inside and the outside. And finally, I, I want to say with this also that one of the, um, one of the works that we focus in, in the book and also that I've been involved with writing is, um, is a case where technologies were introduced in schools and where we as an in, in company actually worked on involving a large number of different levels from individual teachers to the parliament and to the national agencies that are somewhat uh, controlling schools in participatory design processes. But as you can maybe see uh, in the table, I've included the kind of activities that they did with these, when each of these different kinds were rather different. So we're not talking about involving parliament members and teachers in the same activities and maybe not even in the same kind of activities. So I think we're talking a little bit about what I think is the situation today and, and what can be done. I think it's important to say that when say Aarhus University excuses themselves from, from involving users because of uh, tender and procurement processes, that, that it is actually possible to do tender and procurement with other measures than just price. You don't have to buy the cheapest version of things all the time. So in that sense, I think maybe one could work a little bit more on finding out what would be these other measures that one would could put into a tender. Also, as I started with, I think uh, maybe, maybe management or whoever also need to have a different sense of time and timing. And maybe we could work some more on negotiation models that would emphasize that users should be involved earlier, basically. Uh, so I think there's room for finding out more, learning more about how we can do negotiation models at different levels of decision making. It may not be the same activity as I hinted at in the previous slide uh, that would happen with the individual users as there would with, say, central, central uh, collaboration committees or something else. Um, and, all, and then, of course, I think the more support we have for local development or local deployment, the better. I also think that there's a lot of potential for um, making making users better at participating in these processes if we look at also working with alternatives outside what we call traditional work. Uh, I won't get into that in a lot of detail, but I think there's a lot of there's a, a lot of interesting cases and more could be done there. Then I think you know, there are still things to be said about uh, the the national and international new, for instance, uh, legislation that could be improved a lot. And I think underlying this is, of course, you know, how do we get big tech under some form of, form of control? And that's actually also what we wrote about in the paper with uh, Liam Bannon and, and Jeff Patel that, that got referenced in, in the call for this workshop. Um, and then I think, you know, technology empowerment and dem democratic uh, participation is at essence. And, uh, you know, we, we, we may need to work. I, I actually think we should, we should 
think about how to educate people better for these kind of things. Uh, so I think, for instance, that, that technology education in schools should be maybe more focusing on, on empowerment and, and democracy than, say, teaching spreadsheets or whatever. Not not to exclude that, but just to say, I think there, there, are, there are more think, issues at stake here. I think this is, I'm done with that. And uh, so over to uh, Justin or whoever is in charge of what happens it's so awesome from here. Thanks a lot, Suzanne. And uh, indeed, that will be me. Um, well, first of all, thanks a lot for your remarks and also a personal apology for reducing uh, participatory design to uh, people sitting together in a room, uh, co designing technology, uh, users and academics. <laughs> That's perhaps not exactly uh, the whole gist of it. And thanks for also explaining that. And you mentioned a lot of things um, also for moving forward. Um, what I found specifically very interesting myself is that you said that you were personally involved in the Utopia project, which I think is still the key example of where, um, you know, unions, academics, civil society tried uh, to get really directly uh, into the weeds of developing technology systems, software systems uh, that could improve work quality, for instance. Um, so I've, I'm very tempted to ask a lot of personal questions about that, but I won't because um, A, um, we already have questions in the Q&A box. So I also encourage the audience to put more. Uh, we will get to that in a second. But first, I would like to give the floor also to um, Michael Six. He's a programmer, engineer, and designer at Oxford University. And to Joanna Bonovica, who is a researcher at the European University Viadrina. Um, they will have some specific questions for you, Suzanne. You can answer that. And then afterwards, uh, we can move to the general Q&A moderated by Christina. So uh, please, Michael, I'll give you the floor. And then afterwards, Suzanne, then Joanna, and then Suzanne, and then we move to Christina. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Professor Bothgar. Thank you to everyone for being here. I, I really appreciate, as someone who's been involved in software development and trade union work, uh, but not really very much in participatory design. I was really uh, struck by the emphasis that you put on the sort of background work that's happening when we're not necessarily sitting down talking to users or potential users. That was really informative for me. I have two questions, uh, which are both sort of, well, one one is just to ask you to expand a little bit on a point uh, that you made, which is about alternatives outside traditional work. I'm wondering what... Uh, what you might have meant by that. I have some ideas, but uh, I'd love to hear that. And then I, I have a question about procurement processes. And I wonder, I, my basic question is, you know, how open do you think university administrators, just to take an example of, of an interesting kind of group of managers, right? So university is a different setting than, you know, Volkswagen, for example. Um, and I wonder if it's, if in your experience or in your speculation, you might think, yeah, university administrators might be more open to having this kind of conversation, or they might be less open because there might be certain pressures. Um, so yeah, those are my, my two questions. Thank you. Yeah, I, when, I think with this whole idea of what it's basically, I think one of the, um, one of the things that that uh, you know what that we've seen is that there's a lot of spillover effects between the kind of technologies we use in our homes in various kinds of communities that we are involved with and at work. And I think the um, you know we could in a way make make better use of that in terms of. So showing to people how other kinds of technology development processes could happen, like outside the workplace, in different kinds of organizations and communities that people are otherwise involved with. And I think, you know, there are, there, there are a number of, there's been a number of European projects that, that are trying to uh, involve people you know, unemployed people, less fortunate groups uh, in society in 
in alternative technologies. And I think, you know, it may be a good thing for, for all of us uh, to be aware that we also make choices when we go and, I don't know, buy a phone off the shelf um, and put stuff on it. Uh, but but also, I mean, what we work with here are uh, organic food communities and stuff like that. And I'm not saying they are the same as a workplace, but I think, you know, you you can, you can learn more about what kind of choices are made and what kind of options are there, really, if you participate in some of these other kinds of projects. Um, and I think that's, the rest is kind of speculation. Regarding procurement and universities, you know what, I think it's, it's a really good question. In a way, you could think that, say, university administration would be more open to or more, uh, have a better, you know, have, take an interest in, in in their uses in a different way than sort of sort of sort of hardcore business would. In my experience, it's not the case. I would say, I mean, I remember having been brought into AU development projects many years ago to talk about participatory design. I wouldn't say anything much have come out of it. I wonder if part of that is actually that there's so much external pressure in a way on performance uh, on on in public administration in general that it that it's maybe just difficult for for these people to to an, anticipate that, that that this is something i think there's another slightly uh, i mean if i'm a bit sort of uh, bored with with this i think there's uh, there's also a certain tension, say, in the university about what the universities are there for. And so every once in a while, the administration tend to uh, forget that, that, you know, what universities are really doing is research and education and not, and not administration. Uh, and I wonder, I mean, I'm not sure. I actually, I'm thinking, say, if you take bulk like, I'm actually quite sure convinced that that the administration of what's right and that you know they get drilled all the time into the idea that you're producing cars this is the other thing is just administration so i wonder if in in public administration this sort of idea that that we are here for the administration you know has taken over a little bit too much but now i'm just again i'm speculating and i'm just being critical on my own behalf and but I don't think always university is terribly unique in that in that aspect for me. Hi, um thank you Susanna for uh, for this talk. Um my name is Joanna Bernovicka and I'm a sociologist uh, working at a law department and the Center for Interdisciplinary and Labor Law Studies. And my own research is focused on how law is um, becoming a practice. Uh, so how, for example, GDPR uh, turns into enforcement practices, but also on the other hand, how workers uh, organize and mobilize for rights. And well, workers who, for example, don't necessarily um, function within the unions, but create alternative structures like collectives or, you know, in Berlin, we have this uh, Berlin Tech Worker Coalition, which is an advocacy network which exists sort of in parallel to union. So um, I think what was very interesting in your talk for me was um, that I was thinking that participatory design, other than being also an idea, is simply a practice that gets, you know, uh, routinized, so spread through communities. And um, and I thought it was very interesting that you drew this distinction between, you know, we could uh, focus our efforts on updating the modes or models of negotiations, that's one practice, a practice that already exists, and we could try to update that. But uh, really inspirational with your project of Utopia is just thinking, okay, one practice is creating alternative tech, uh, technical alternatives. This is something that uh, I think is very exciting. And in general, um, my questions uh, are built on the reflection that, you know, there's these sort of three desperate, the, the separate communities um, technical experts, workers and their representatives, and 
what we call sometimes connectors. And there are positive developments in each uh, of these communities. At least the way I see uh, the communities of technical experts, it is becoming more diverse and heterogeneous. There are different skill sets, different approaches, but it's also aware of certain problems like, um, you know, AI having disparate effects on different groups of people, algorithmic bias, uh, impacts of algorithmic management. So um, I feel like there is a um, genuine willingness to use this expertise to promote equality and participation. And on the other hand, I think workers and their representatives are also willing to experiment and talk more about technology. And here, I think that you know there's one way to go is through these models of co-determination and, and then unions would need uh, technical expertise. And the other one that, of course, is close to my heart is uh, also going a little bit beyond the unions and directly to the workers and uh, where they're, um, you know, especially in places that they might be skeptical of unions or unions simply don't exist and engaging directly uh, with workers on the ground. And so, of course, I think that uh, universities, researchers, think tanks, unions can also be, be these connectors um, between these two groups of people. But I wanted to ask you um, two questions, which is how do you see, you know, um, strengths and opportunities in your own community for reaching out to workers? And um, that's uh, my first question. And um, yeah, what do you think uh, if we wanted to you know, start by implementing certain practices. What do you think could be could be this model alternative practice? Yeah, I think first of all, I mean, I my my sense is that, for instance, if you ask basically all the computer science students that we have in Aarhus, and that's quite a lot, or you know, the graduates, or for that matter, probably in general, get large. They kind of know that it's probably a good thing to talk to the users about about the technology. I, my my sense is that they don't understand why and what the consequences are if if you do so. So they don't. They 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 are looking at the idea of of. Talking to users primarily from the qual from what no not quality but from the perspective of getting as much understanding of the of the use of the technology or the future technology out of people as possible. So I don't think they really understand what it is that the users had to bargain with in a certain way. Like why should they give away that knowledge if they don't get anything back? And so so I think. Uh, that that there's a lot of collaboration between users and designers happening, you know, every day. Say say in Denmark, and and this is in a way how how we, um, how our graduates are brought up. But it's still, you know, it's it's still not well understood why, and in particular what it is that these users, the workers in various places, uh, have a, what is at stake for them? What is it that they're, they're selling if they're talking to these people? So so in that sense, I think there are issues with this sort of power and conflict that, 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 that still needs, is, that is still a concern. So, so I think the strengths and opportunities for sure, I mean, we, I would say all our students know how to do like workshops with users. They don't they not always end up doing it, but then most of them end up working with somebody who does, right? Yeah. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's more about the underlying understanding of what, what is at stake here. Uh, I'm not sure that in a way, whether that also answers a little bit to to your other question, um, in general, I my my feeling is that that uh, in a way you can say in the same way as it's important to talk to users, it's maybe also important that it is the actual technologists who who 
come out and talk to people and then there aren't too many intermediate layers between the two because I think there are a lot of uh, people qualifications, not, not necessarily just real people, but also like anthropologists and psychologists and what have you who are offering themselves in, in this role of intermediaries. But, but I think talking about technological alternatives, if you don't understand the technologies, then, then maybe it's better to not have these intermediate levels there. So maybe that was not really an answer to your question, but I think it's the best I can do for now. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Joanna and Six, for those questions and Suzanne for your answers. We also have already five questions in the Q&A box, so I'd really like to give the floor to Christina Kolklov, who will moderate the Q&A session. Christina is the founder of the Why Not Lab, which focuses a lot on workers' issues around the digitalization of the workplace. And uh, very uh, opportune for this event, she also has been closely involved in the development of the We Clock app which helps workers track and log their working hours and much more. And it was designed by workers for workers, which to me sounds suspiciously a lot like something that we could call participatory design. Uh, so Christina, please take it, uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Justin, and thank you, Susanna. So we got some lovely questions in the chat, uh, which are very much and also link into sort of the questions I'm burning in with the, the, the who, the why and the how, really. Who should be involved? How should they be involved? Uh, and what should they be discussing? And and this links, Susanna, to something I noticed you said in your speech, which was back in the 70s, you spent a lot of time, you said, training labor unions to be able to actually participate in this participatory design. And I think this is key. We don't know what we don't know. And you just ended up saying, that if you don't understand the technology, then it can be very difficult to participate in these processes. So maybe first and foremost, we need to know what we need to know so that we can actively and meaningfully engage in shaping technology. Um, just just the thought hit. So the questions in the chat, and please do keep them keep them coming, is about. Firstly, why? Why should people get engaged in this? And there, I think there's a wonderful question uh, right at the top here is, is whether you have any suggestions as to how to talk with stakeholders so that they see the value in involving, in this case, workers and unions in, in the design of software. And then I'd like to add to that uh, something we discussed before everybody joined us is, should we beyond just participatory design, also talk about particip participatory deployment of technology. So first, you know, how do we get going on all of this? Um, do you have any suggestions about how to get the process going? And you mentioned also their time. How do we, in this rapid world of ours, secure the time for this process? Those are all really good and lovely questions. Uh, and I mean, I, I guess I can, I can answer to some parts. I, I, I think that the, the why, well, of course you can say that, well, technology and, and information technology is largely very influential for the way we live our lives today. I mean, in societies at large and definitely also in the workplace. So I don't know. I mean, why should people get involved? I mean, why should people get involved in uh, understanding? I don't know the basic skills like math and math and language and stuff. Why should they be involved in other aspects or of democratic discourse? I, I, I do think that that we have a role for talking about technological empowerment or whatever at 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 all levels of society, but I think it is important that people understand that this doesn't just mean that we need to be good at programming spreadsheets 
it's more or something, but that we, that it's actually uh, legitimate in a way to, to, to work with uh, requirements and, uh, and so on at many different levels uh, and also political levels. So again, when I showed this figure, obviously, if you talk with members of parliament about the, uh, the education of technology, well, in technology topics in primary schools in Denmark, you don't start by teaching them how to, to uh, program spreadsheets, right? Um, this is a discourse that is happening at other levels. So I think the whole empowerment thing for a lot of these levels, um, technological empowerment should be as important as any other topic of sort of the understanding and skill in, in society. And I think it's an important one because as you're saying, technology is coming, it's happening sooner than we, we know it and, and all the time. And, and so of course we should be able to in a way fend for our rights and, and stake our, you know, the, find out what the risks and opportunities are. So, so I do think that at it's important to to think about educating people at large and whether that's then done through through education of union representatives or in the workplace or it's done in different kinds of NGOs or it's done in the schools. I think those things are actually all important. But but I think it's important to also exactly prompt for schools and so on to to get away from this idea that that if you talk about technology and computing, it's about how how you program. It's I mean that's obviously one of the things, and maybe you can't avoid doing some level of programming, just like you can't avoid doing some level of mathematics in school or <laughs> or, or or language, you know, Danish, English, whatever whatever your language is, right? Is so that is part of, of educating. Um, so, so I don't know. I'm not sure I answered the the whole. You're, you know, for sure. I, I mean, I'm. Yeah, you did, in the sense that we need to know what we need to know. We also need to understand that that you know beyond, or as Tim Wu he called it, the tyranny of convenience. Beyond the convenience of the use of technology, there's the question of ethics, of rights, of empowerment, and so on. I think this is. This acknowledgement will be key for people to want to be able to be involved in shaping the technology. Um, there's another question here, which is more on the process as well from, from Mary Towers, and which is quite interesting, something I personally haven't thought about myself either. But she says here that there's an untapped pool of expertise in commercial enterprises that have developed stakeholder input processes. And whether this this sort of um, this methodology could be transferred to others. And then Mary mentions an examples of partners in law firms who have collaborated with startups to develop legal tech incredibly quickly and effectively. ChatGDPT law tech is an example. So her question is, could we perhaps call on these types of professionals to carry out pro bono work to pass on this knowledge, this expertise, this methodolo methodology uh, to to nonprofits and, for example, workers. Do you have any thoughts on that type of methodological transfer? I yeah, I don't. I mean, I I don't actually know enough the details of any of that. I think, you know, the kind of methods that we use for this type of thing has always been influenced on, you know, back and forth with a number of different. Both, both commercial enterprises, uh, you know, anything, advertising, creative businesses and so on. So I, I think on the methodological level, I mean, I think participatory design is very, it, it invites anything in that, that, that might have, you know, offer, offer good, good choice, good alternatives. Um, I'm not a big fan of pro bono work, but that's just because I think, you know, 
people should get paid for the work they do. But I also, of course, do understand that there are other issues out there. I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, also, Mary, uh, yeah, a thought here could be to really lean on and get inspired by the growing work on citizen assemblies, for example. I think this is a very sort of participatory action um, that, that could, that as a methodology that could be... It is that, in that whole area, there's, of course, also a lot happening. Right? Yeah, yeah. So then we have uh, some questions here, sort of more on, on the outcomes or the process as well. Bettina has a question which I think sort of sits between this, the question of individualistic effects, how is technology impacting me, but then also the collective impacts, how is it impacting others? And here Bettina asked, uh, she was wondering how the understanding of user has changed or could be reflected with increasingly complex technologies that are also impacting non-users. So I might have a technology, and let's take a little example, I might have a Google Home. Now, those who know me would know I would never have a Google Home, but let's say I had one or an Alexa. But that impacts potentially people who come and visit me at home yet they are not involved in the Google Alexa. So is how do we expand our understanding of user to also include those who are actually non-users? Yeah, I, I, I definitely think that that is a good question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in a way, I would say that if you talk about organizations, I don't think there are any non-users nowadays, right? And even even if you talk about us as citizens, definitely in Denmark, you know, you, you literally cannot be a non-user. And uh, so, so I agree that, that, you know, you, it's, it's a good idea to, to think about the many possible types of users that can be there. And, and I also do. Uh, I mean, of course, it's possible to to uh, be a non-user as as in the way you were talking about, it, Christine, with, with you know choosing to not have a Google something in in your home, right? But actually, if you are at work, you can't do those choices. Basically, at least it has to be done more subversively, right? Because because you are in. You know, certain things are forced on you, no matter whether you like it or not. <laughs> it's, mm. And it's both use and non-use. In Denmark, there's been lately a uh, big discussion of whether you can have TikTok on your work phone, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, and, and so, so I don't actually think most choices are choices you you make yourself, right? I think what what you can maybe negotiate a little bit back and forth is whether this is my work phone or my private phone. I'll show you this is actually an AU phone. It so happens that the uh, the SIM card that is in it is my own. Uh, but, but you know, what does it mean that this is an AU phone or not an AU phone? Can I, I think um, it's not, it's not terribly transparent. Um, anyway, that was sort of long story <laughs> and I don't know even if we got all the aspects of what what was talked about initially. No, but I could quickly on the phone thing mention a case in Holland where a woman who had an employer-provided phone found out she was pregnant, downloaded a pregnancy app. She hadn't told the employer, but they fired her the day after because they had a mobile management system on the phone, could see she downloaded a pregnancy app and managed to fire her before she told them. So be careful. <laughs> That's a side story. We have some more great questions, and these are more to do with the outcomes, really. Two questions uh, of similar nature, but do you know of any examples uh, of uh, results of collective bargaining or, or anywhere else, Denmark or anywhere else, where the, the disclosure of technology or participatory design of software is becoming part of the collective bargaining process or negotiations? And then that leads to the second question, which are, do you know of any examples uh, or what examples of worker tech rights do you admire? So, so two questions on the outcome here. Uh, I think I want to start by saying that um, 
we may have forgotten, but you know, when we used to have a uh, big, when we didn't, before we had laptops, we had computer screens, right? And they were, they were certified by something which was actually uh, a Swedish labor. Yeah, and the TCO. Yeah. The TCO. So, so actually what happened was that, that the, the TCO managed to get really to brand this label as the ones who were providing the right alternatives in, co in terms of screen technology. And I think, you know, this is just an interesting case. I have Peter book over Peter Boyle's book on my, on my bookshelf. And I think it's a really interesting story how that all happened. And, and of course it kind of started together with some of the early projects. And for the same reason, you can say as the utopia, project, namely to say that, you know, if, if we have a right as workers to say no to particular technologies, it's a heck of a lot easier if we can point to some alternatives. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, this is important for this, um, for this TCO case, really. And yeah. um, I, I want to be honest and say that I have not, I feel really guilty in a way. I haven't much followed, um, so collective bargains and technology agreements and so on in later years. Every year I do a lecture with my students where I talk about how this is an issue that has kind of disappeared. And, and every year I'm thinking, yes, I should, you know, I should learn some more about these things. I should go and find out. Yeah. Uh, but the essence is I don't. And so. So really, I don't know because I haven't. No. Almost uh, I can just as a disclaimer uh, that you all know that in uh, a month or so, we are launching uh, a collective bargaining database, which is open for all to see for Public Services International, which is the global union for public services unions, which show actual clauses, model language, contract language, uh, negotiated on all things digital. And that includes as well the right to be consulted uh, and so forth on, on technology. Now, there's two uh, questions. Uh, one of them is, is proving popular in the chat here with, with some thumbs up, which I also think is a very interesting question. Uh, but I'm going to give you both of them because we have just about a minute left. But where does no code tool sit in this approach? Uh, the question goes, should we jump on board and follow the promise of being able to create technology that can do away with the need of intervention from designers and programmers? Or should we disregard it as an empty promise that won't be realized? That's question number one. And the second question is, is there a space for participation when licenses are negotiated during the procurement process? So two big questions, short time, Susanna, over to you. I, yeah, I think regarding the last one, I'm sure there is. I will not be able to tell you exactly how that should be done. But again, I think that 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 could probably be, I, it could be a really interesting question, I would say. Uh, regarding, I mean, I think there are a lot of interesting questions of uh, open source, uh, open software and end user development and all sorts of things. Um, we, it's, I, you know, I, I tend to be a, a realist in a way. So I, I don't think that, that there's much hope that in a sense, we can just start over with some of these, uh, with some of these things. So, so I think we need to stand on maybe two or maybe more legs, one of which is to follow and monitor and, and, uh, ask questions to, and put requirements for standardized software and all of that. And the other is that, that, you know, the more cases we have of people who work with different kinds of, uh, open technologies and, and do stuff and, and not least really show that things can be different with these things, mm. you know, the, the better, but I don't, I, I mean, I, I think we need to do both in a way. Wonderful. 
So we need to we need to act in in other words. That's also my takeaway is we need and all of us here who are uh, active in these fields of various sides, be it from technologists, workers, activists, or whoever. We also really need to teach forward and remind people to reclaim their rights, I would say, in this technological world. So over to you, Justin, to, to wrap us up. And thank you, Susanna, for your brilliant answers. Thank you all for your wonderful questions. Over to Justin. You're so welcome. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll keep it very short because time is very limited. We're a little bit over time. Uh, first, Christina, thanks a lot for the moderation and I can just uh, fully support your call to action. Thanks a lot to Suzanne for her very extremely interesting and enlightening remarks. Um, and yeah, thank you to the audience uh, for having sat with us the past hour and also for your active participation in this event. Um, this was it uh, for this morning. Uh, we'll come up with... Uh, future events on similar topics. So keep an eye out on the website of the Confluence Center on the future of work of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. And uh, on that, I wish you uh, an excellent morning and an excellent continuation of the week. Thank you very much and goodbye.